Back here, uh, Ben in for Jenk. Jenk will be back later in the week. I, again, love Mitt Romney and Rick Perry claiming to have read each other's books in a moment of shocking lack of creativity on my part. I couldn't think of anything I'd rather read less, but I've been thinking about it since. And I, I, you, you love the idea of Mitt Romney reading Rick Perry's book at night, that he can't be bothered. But things I'd rather read instead of uh, Rick Perry's book are, are you know, like uh, a, a Jackie Collins novel, uh, Red Book, which I don't even think still exists anymore, The Washington Times. Come on, I read your book. Rick Perry can't read. Come on. So, pressure on the group of ten, the group of twelve. I'm sorry, the guys who will come up with a winning plan and fix the federal deficit. There's pressure. Fifty-seven prominent business executives and former government officials signed a petition saying they need to go big. They can't take an additional 1.2 to 1.5 trillion dollars off the deficit. They got to think big. They got to get it up to four trillion. They've already agreed to one. That would be three more that they would have to do. So they sent this letter. Again, it's from a centrist group, but it's obviously everything tilts right. But nonetheless, these guys are filled with a degree of reasonableness to some extent. But, and they urge Republicans to do the same. Erskine Bowles and Alan Simpson, who chaired the panel, signing the letter too, and they think there's still some chance that these guys will go big and cut the deficit even more. But they all recognize, even the Republicans, including former economic advisors to Presidents Nixon and Reagan, saying that, the, of course, the, like, it doesn't seem likely that Republicans will compromise. And it's because you're dealing with people who, coming up with a compromise of between one and 10, they think that compromise is 1.1 or 0.9. That's their idea of a compromise. So you can talk all you want. We all know what's going to happen, and it's not going to happen. But nonetheless, because these guys say that part of that is going to be significant tax reform. They can't even say raising taxes. They at least call it tax reform, but we know that's what they mean. But the Republicans won't go that. That's why they'll be at 1.1, because they're not going to give anything on any tax increase, even though if you're going to reduce the deficit by $4 trillion, any logical person, the, every single economist in the planet, in the known universe, knows you have to raise taxes. So, but the Republicans, they don't raise taxes on you. They're good, man. They let you keep money in your pocket because Washington's too big and Rick Perry's gonna make uh, government inconsequential. Washington's gonna be inconsequential in your lives because Republicans, they don't raise taxes. They give you your money, man. You keep your money. That's why you're gonna vote for Rick Perry, man, because you are gonna have, if you have $22 right now in your pocket, this time in 2013 when Rick Perry's president, you'll have $29. That should be his campaign theme. I will give you seven more dollars than you have right now because Washington sucks. And I don't even, I won't even live there. I won't hire anybody. I won't do anything. I'll just execute people. That's it. You want somebody killed, you call me. Otherwise, I'm not hiring anybody. I'm not running an agency. I'm not doing anything. I'm just gonna give you seven bucks. So, so Republicans claim that they lower taxes, but around the country, the degree of the increase in fees at every level of government has increased dramatically. So first of all, federal level, when you're running a significant deficit, you need to raise money. The, uh, the federal government can go into deficit spending. Ronald Reagan increased deficit spending, increased the national debt through deficit spending by 14%. The Bushes upped it by around 10% annually. Bill Clinton, 4.2%. Again, just a little reminder. But states, local communities, they can raise fees. First of all, they can't deficit spend. They're mandated not to. They can't do it. They can't create money that they don't have. So they have to come up with the money other ways. And they're not going to raise taxes on you. That's one way. It's incredibly unpopular. Cutting programs unpopular. So what they've decided to do is raise fees. And they've done it by raising it on every single citizen they have. It doesn't matter whether you make $14 million a year or $14,000 a year. You pay the same increase where for renewing your driver's license. If it goes from $38 a year to $108 a year, it doesn't matter whether you're Steve Jobs or Steve O, you're going to pay the same rate. Steve O can afford it too. So, and that's from renewing your motorcycles to, as it says here in this article, hunting, this is an article by Jonathan Holland, an alternate, whether it's a hunting license or your, or your driver's license. USA reported across the country, state and local governments are turning user fees fees that everybody has to pay into quick cash, whether that's driver's license, hunting licenses, the license to register your kid's little league team to play ball, those are skyrocketing, and there are many more. Look at this. Wall Street Journal reporting back in May, public schools across the country shifting costs to students and their parents by boosting fees on things that we all did when we were growing up for free, field trips. Anything at all. You have field trip? No. There's going to be a fee involved if you want to take your kid along on that field trip. Riding the bus. Fees added to have your kid ride the bus to school. 
asking parents to supply core supplies for core classes, from biology lab safety goggles to algebra workbooks to printer ink. Parents got to pay for that. But we're not raising taxes. We're not raising taxes on you. You're just going to have to pay this. Uh, and it gets to uh, arguably even worse. By the way, as we, I mentioned earlier in the show, just in general, the cost of an education. Use this. 1957, if you went to the University of Minnesota, tuition at the University of Minnesota in 1957, $111 a year. That's the equivalent today of $750 a year. Now it's over $8,000 a year. $750, uh, inflation adjusted, 1957, $8,000 now. But your taxes are lower. So that's great news. Colorado, Connecticut, Hawaii, Massachusetts, Florida, California, Oklahoma, New Jersey, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, all raising fees on motor vehicles, uh, on registering your motor vehicles, so much so that they've created backlashes in that state. Hawaii legislature produced, produced, uh, proposed 22 new fees or fee hikes this year alone. According to the Tax Foundation, your cell phone, everybody, nobody understands their cell phone bill, but everybody has a cell phone, and everybody looks at that bill, and they're bewildered by it. 11% of your cell phone bill goes to local state taxes, local taxes and state taxes. 5% federal taxes, so 16% total, but the local and state fees are more than twice as much as the federal taxes on your cell phone, and it's 16% of your frickin' bill. Uh, this is uh, Arizona legislature just passed legislation that will allow prisons to charge your family to come and see you in prison. The fees are being justified as, quote, a background check fee, says Jonathan Turley, but staffers admit it's an effort to increase revenue at the expense of those families. And that's just for visiting. A couple more uh, fees that are being proposed, again, at prisons and jails across the country. They're grabbing all manners of fees from the inmates themselves. According to uh, uh, the Polk County Jail, this is according to the Polk County Jail website in Florida, inmates are charged a $30 one time per diem fee when they're booked into jail. Uh, they pay uh, $9 for a hygiene kit and an underwear fee. Uh, and again, the fees, obviously, because the people are in uh, prison, it's going to get passed on to their families. Um, uh, it's, it, it, most of the fee hikes uh, are reflected, by the way, in changes in the tax code, as it says here. When Reagan took office, 47% um, uh, paid less to Uncle Sam than they were making in 1981, so 47% pay less now. But if you make only $15,000 a year, your actually taxes have spiked by 51% over time. In the 1940s, corporations, by the way, in the 1940s paid 43% of all taxes. In the 1940s, corporations pay 43% of all income taxes collected in the country. 1950s, that had dropped to 39%, 43% in the, in the 40s. 39% in the 1950s, it's now 19%. But again, what we should do here is, again, I think prisoners should pay the fees. Prisoners' families should pay them, because prisoners' families are generally, they're so well off. So again, this is a fantastic piece. It's in the uh, alternate uh, from Jonathan Holland about the fees being raised across the country and why Republicans who are claiming they're for smaller government are raising the fees slowly and stealthily through the back door on you instead of raising your taxes. But you're still paying those fees every time you register your car. All right, everybody. Uh, Anna will be back at the Social Commentary Hour with me. Good stories. Stay with us. Young Turks, everybody, this is where Anna shows why I'm an idiot, because, like, here's the deal, and I know this is going to make the people, who, it, 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 look, it's just ignorance, because I read a story, this is, I'll just be to, uh, totally honest, you read a story, Coral Roos will be gone by the end of the century, mm -hmm. and I think, whatever, legitimately. I think that most people, especially most Americans, would have a similar reaction to yours, okay? And, and, and it's because they don't know how that will affect them personally. Americans totally. simply don't care about anything unless it affects them personally. That's exactly right. Right, so <laughs> I'm going to tell you why it would affect you. Do coral reefs, can they get me laid? Possibly, if you take a girl on an awesome cruise and then you guys go snorkeling, do a little snorkel action. Tell me she more. She might snorkel tell, you. Tell me more. Okay. <laughs> So, um, a UN scientist uh, d just released a study, in fact, he wrote an entire book about how the coral reefs will cease to exist by the end of the century. Now, people are asking, why is this relevant to us? Would you, you rather read this book or Rick Perry's book? Uh, I would probably just read this article about this and I'd be, <laughs> I'd be satisfied. Okay, the whole book, come on. 
I wouldn't read an entire <laughs> book about the coral reefs. Look, that's just me. It's not my. It's not something that I'm particularly interested in. But I am interested in what his findings are. So I'm going to tell you what they are right now. So the coral reefs will be gone by the end of the century, and that's at, at least what. Pr pr what Professor Peter Sale is saying, he's from the University of Sydney. And the reason why this will have an effect on us is because a quarter of all sea life lives in the coral reefs, right? Even though it's only 1%, uh, despite it covers only like 0.1% of the oceans. Exactly, yeah. and it's an entire ecosystem. And when you get rid of an entire ecosystem where a quarter of all sea life lives, it's gonna have an effect on all marine life. So what you're gonna see is uh, the fishing business is obviously gonna be uh, severely affected by this, okay? So, it, yeah. and, and that of course will have an effect on the economy. And you know, people think that it's not, a, it's not that big of a deal, but it's a huge deal. No, it's a huge deal, and I'm being a dick, but it's, the, and, and it's part of the problem that global, that the climate change uh, activists who are doing the right thing have to overcome is this sense that there are more pressing progressive concerns than this. Mm -hmm. And that's partly what it is. I'm like, this is not gonna help people pay their bills. So I tend not to care. And what those guys, and, and led by sort of Al Gore, have to me failed to do, partly, mostly because of my own ignorance, but why, not so much failed to do, why they still have to work, is they have to get us to care. They have to get as many progressives as care about everything else to care as much about this. When he says we've wiped out a lot of species over the years, this will be the first time we've eliminated an entire ecosystem. There's no way that I should be able to read that quote and react like, whatever. Right. Well, as I mentioned, you, you have to realize how it affects you personally and how it affects our economy and how it affects your pocket, or pocketbook. You, or even anybody else's. I don't need it personal, I need, but I need it human. Right. I need to know how it affects people's lives, how it's going to hurt people, and or what the dangers are long term. That if it continues at this rate, then what the overall damage is. When we just that it's not just you can't be cavalier about the damage done to the planet. Exactly. So I'm being a jerk, but I I, I know it at least. But I still think it's part of the disconnect that's happened in climate change. That it's, and I don't I, I obviously I don't know how to do it, but I know the work still needs to be done. It turns out that one third of the carbon dioxide that we create gets, or, or the extra carbon dioxide that we create gets absorbed by the ocean. And that ca uh, causes um, the acidification of the ocean. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Acidification. Acidif acidif okay. Let's move on. <laughs> Acidification causes of the ocean. Causes acid in the ocean. Causes acid in the ocean, <laughs> which I should have gone with. Yeah. Acidification. I just would have left it alone. <laughs> I just, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have tried. I saw it and I thought, I'm not saying that. <laughs> but you know what? You went for it. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> and I, I came out strong, right? You did. B plus. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> totally. I'm such a disaster. But anyway, important story. I thought that uh, we should mention it. Um, moving on, the Central Basin Municipal Water District is paying uh, news companies over $200,000 to write favorable coverage about their water district. And what's happening now is Google News picks up these sources as legitimate news sources. And when you research for these uh, guys and you want to find out what's really going on with these uh, companies and with these water districts, all you see is favorable news coverage. Look, here's what we got to talk about right now. Because this is, the, uh, uh, I, I didn't realize at first that this would connect to something that happened when I, uh, over the weekend when I was in the Telluride Film Festival in Colorado, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and I'm with people who care about movies and I kept wanting to talk about this and nobody was interested. But on, I check Google News 25 times a day on my phone, mm -hmm. right? And the third story in was a story about Sarah Palin barnstorming through Iowa. This was last over Labor Day weekend. And I click on it, you know, and it was a column, a column, an opinion piece from the Washington Times, mm -hmm. which is a fake newspaper yes. run by the Reverend Moon, an incredibly conservative paper. And this was a guy who opened for Sarah Palin at one of these events. Like he got up there and then he's like, and I was so impressed with her in the liberal media, they just want her to fail and she's so delightful. And, and it was the third story down on Google News. I know. It's not a real story. Okay, I love that you brought that up because that's a really great example. And I think this is where Google fails. Google okay. fails in determining what is and is not a reliable and reputable news company or a, a news outlet. So in this case, with the Central Basin Municipal Water District, which is an insanely long name for a water district, um, 
they had something known as News Hawks Review write a great article about them. That's not a real news source. It's a fake news source. So Google doesn't know that, and they pick that up, and you know it's in the news feed. You search for uh, this water district, and it's one of the first articles that yeah. pops up. And it's a disaster because it completely blurs the line of publicity versus actual news. Totally, it's a big problem, and mm -hmm. and it matters that it matters there. It matters more when it's about sort of how great and awesome Sarah Palin is. And somehow I sense that in these news feeds all across the country, there is going to be a greater likelihood that the Washington Times piece or the news, what's it called? News Maxer's piece? It, it, news Hawks Review. The News Hawks Reviews piece on the Central Basin Water District. Um, that the they'll get there, water district. but Jenk Uger's uh, Huffington, Post piece, Huffington Post piece, sort of his diatribe against the outrages uh, committed by the Republicans' re regressive taxes that are laying it to working class Americans, that won't get in the news feed. That's not going to happen. But somehow the greatness of Sarah Palin does. Some alternate piece about, I don't, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think the alternate piece about regressive taxes gets in or about, you know, uh, 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 about any sort of progressive cause. Somehow I don't feel like we're on that. If you happen to type in the right keywords, it makes it, but it's buried. But I'm not even talking about making it. I'm just talking about the front page of Google News. This oh was it. Oh my God. This right. was story three. This was just, oh, look, Sarah. And Sarah Palin barnstorming through Iowa is a news story. But the one that is featured can't be that one. It can't be an opinion piece from a guy who wrote in the, in the Washington Times about how great she was. You got to search for that. You can find that. That should be there. That's a choice people can make. But it can't be the main one. It can't appear as if that's a news story. And I get the feeling that 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 progressive causes don't come up. I don't know. I'm 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 totally curious. I don't think it's a giant conspiracy. I think it's them taking advantage of something. That I don't we're think missing. it. I don't even think it would be far fetched for it to be a giant conspiracy. Look, money talks, and I think that there is a lot of corruption in the media than we even realize at this point. Yeah, but not at Google. <laughs> Well, I know, not at Google, but but Google needs to be better about figuring out yeah, what, what's a reputable news source and what isn't. I just feel like there should be somebody, there should be a person in charge of that. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, no. God, they'd be so busy. <laughs> they would be. Give Can me a break, imagine? give me a break. Yeah. All right, what else? All right. Uh, relationship columnist Dan Savage says that monogamy is making us miserable and we should all sleep with other people when, when we're married. Who okay. is this guy? Dan Savage is apparently a relationship columnist, and he recently wrote this uh, long column about how straight couples should be more like gay couples, which doesn't make much sense. Like, I didn't know that all gay couples like cheated on each other and they were fine with it. But that's that's his perspective. By the way, Dan Savage is gay. So. By the way, it's totally true because they're guys, not because they're gay. But guys, given an opportunity to sleep with other men, often. I mean, guys no, give no, an no, opportunity. Sorry, maybe guys they do. A, maybe they do, but. Do all gay couples have the, like this agreement with one another that they're going to go sleep no, around and be not. okay with it? Yeah, he's arguing that gay guys, you know, have like this uh, unspoken yeah. agreement to sleep I, around and it's totally my, fine. My hunch is that it's true, but it's not because they're gay; it's because they're men. Because they're men. And if you gay, if, if if women gave men that same opportunity, we'd be like fantastic. It's just that you won't do that. Mm -hmm. But other guys are like, yeah, you're a guy. I got it. It's not as big a deal. I'll do it too, and it's a you know that's the beauty of being gay. Is that that part? Mm, okay, <laughs> all right. No, Jake and I have talked about it a zillion times. It's like if you were that you can go out and you could go to a club, and there's a way better chance that you're going to go home with somebody because there are no girls to screw it up. Right. Nothing personal. Okay, so Dan Savage is saying that straight couples should have the exact same mentality when it comes to monogamy because monogamy simply is not a realistic uh, goal for any couple. There's no way that you can remain monogamous. And he also says that, look, you guys should have an understanding that if it happens, it happens, but don't share that information with one another. So if you cheat on your spouse, don't go home and say like, hey, honey, I just banged don't, the chick next door. It's don't unburden deal. yourself. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, so. Ultimately, I don't think it's realistic. I mean, I, I'd love to think that it would be, but it's not. Well, then why don't you do it? Like, if you think it's a good idea, why wouldn't you say the Libby's? I wouldn't do it because even though, in theory, it sounds like a good idea, I know that if, if I were to personally fool around on my boyfriend, mm -hmm. I know that whether I like it or not, 
ultimately, I'm going to get sucked into something new. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's just the way people, well, I, at least I know that's the way women work. I know that women say, yeah, yeah, we can go around, we can screw all these different guys, and we don't get attached, right? Mm -hmm. But whether you like it or not, not at some point, right. you're right. At some point, you get attached. I don't want to do that. It's not going to work out, right? And my and my boyfriend or my husband, who knows? There's a possibility that that could happen to him too, and then I'm going to have to cut people. <laughs> yeah, and you don't want to do that. I don't want to do you know, that. You go to prison. You get all these fees. Right. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to pay eighteen dollars for Scrabble. <laughs> Savage, who's gay, gay, who's gay himself, as you said, insists he's faithful to his partner, and vice versa. <laughs> sure. Okay, then why, why did you write this then? What's, <laughs> I'm just saying other guys are. I mean, I, I, love, I love Ron and he loves me and we're totally faithful to each other. But other gay guys, uh, come on. Oh my god. The problem is, is with Dan Savage. And, and, and he's right, conceptually, right? And guys would, and I say that guys would take advantage of the opportunity if women allowed them to. Because that's the only reason that we don't, is you won't. Like, we, if mm -hmm. we went to a club and we could just have sex with any girl we wanted, it would be fantastic, theoretically. But it wouldn't work for us either. Because then at some point, you guys would too. Mm -hmm. And that would be horrible. You'd be extremely jealous, right? I'd be out of my mind. Yeah. It would be horrific. So ultimately, like, I don't think he's right. I'm totally interested in it, and I would love to have him on the show, and I'd love to talk about it. But in the end, like, in, monogamy may be unnatural, but so is being not monogamous. Right. And you just got to make a call, and there's certain social structures which we've set to enable us to get through life and get along. And going around and having sex with whoever you want to, it, it, it sounds great, like, on from Saturday from four to midnight. Mm -hmm. But that's no way to lead your life. It's just not gonna work. Exactly. Now, there is another aspect to the story that I wanna talk about. When you're married for a long period of time and let's say one person slips up and has a, I don't know, a rendezvous with some other person. A rendezvous? A rendezvous. <laughs> okay. okay, all right, so one person has a rendezvous with someone else. Yes, go on, go if, on. If it's a one-time thing and it was really a slip up, nah, 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 and it wasn't like a coworker or something, <laughs> like, let him go. That's the way I see, that, see it. <laughs> right? Am I right? Or, I know, and don't you, tell what, your spouse. What, don't tell what, your what do you spouse mean, like, about it. It was a coworker. Why did that come up? No, 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 no. But a coworker you see on a daily basis. That's why I referred to a coworker. But if you go to a club or a bar and you just meet a random chick, why are you making that face? And you no, meet I'm not a random chick. I'm looking out there. I'm looking to see who you're talking about. <laughs> What's funny is I'm explaining this to Jesus. <laughs> I know, totally. So that looks like, <laughs> cool. Jesus looks so uncomfortable. He's like, mm. Mm. why is she looking at me? <laughs> I've known her a long time. We're friends. I swear. <laughs> what are you talking about? And she's like, why am I making that face? And that. I'm like, look. And I'm like, God, Dave. <laughs> what are you talking about? You just threw the co-worker thing out there out of nowhere. Like, what difference does that make? What I was trying to explain. Like, your boyfriend would be fine if he said, but a co-worker? Oh, my God. No, I'm saying if my boyfriend cheated on me with a coworker, that would be much worse than if he oh. just had a fling with someone he met at a bar. Especially if there are no other girls here. That'd be a problem. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, so yeah. that's what I, I was trying to say. But that's saying, what I was trying to explain as I was looking at Jesus. Jesus like intently. <laughs> she was staring at Jesus. Oh my Jesus, god. Like, and it says, Jesus, let it go. Just let it go. Just one time. Okay? Forget okay. it. It's over. It's one time. Let's move on. All right, sure. All right. Um, Amber, uh, Amber Duick is suing Toyota for cyber-stalking her in an ad stunt. This is a horrible ad idea. Okay. They were trying to promote their Toyota Matrix, mm -hmm. and uh, in the process of doing, those, doing so, they had something known as Your Other You campaign, where you basically go on their website and you set up this whole prank to prank one of your friends, right? Okay. It's like uh, punked. Okay. okay, so what was happening is Amber Duick w was getting all these emails from a guy who was pretending like he was running away from law enforcement, like he escaped jail and he was running away from police, um, and apparently he needed a place to crash, and he said, here, I have your address, it's blah, 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 and I'm planning on coming over and staying the night. And, and he sent her several emails, and she's freaking out. She, don't, she doesn't know what's going on. Later on, she figures out it's all part of a Toyota stunt. Somebody pranked her through the website. Hmm. Okay, so she's suing the company for intentional infliction of emotional distress, unfair, unlawful, and deceptive trade practices, and neglect misrepresentation. 
So negligent uh, misrepresentation. What happened to her? Uh, like before we rule as to whether this is nonsense and she should shut up. What injury did she suffer? She's saying she suffered from emotional distress. Why? What ha the guy did what? He emailed her several times. It wasn't just once. Several times telling her, I'm going to show up to your house. I'm running away from the law. Um, according to the court document, uh, Sebastian Bowler, that was the guy who, or the fake guy who was going to come to her house. He was an Englishman and soccer fanatic with a drinking problem. Right. And they even created a MySpace, like a fi fake MySpace for him. Anyway, told the plaintiff that he was on a cross-country trip and would be at her house in a few days. After Bowler wrote that, he'd run into some trouble at a motel. Duick received an email from someone purporting to be a manager of the motel who included a bill to Duick saying she was responsible for a TV Bowler had smashed. <laughs> so she's like, oh my God, I don't even know this guy. Why am I going to pay this bill? I, I didn't smash the TV. What's going on? Anyway, do I think she should sue? No, I don't. I don't think she should sue. I, look, it was a prank. Pranks suck sometimes. I, she didn't suffer any damages. I don't think it's that big of a deal. She, uh, uh, she's it, suing for $10 million. <laughs> Come on. She didn't click on the link. Also, the link in the first email was like, hey, this is a fake. And she never clicked on the link. Mm -hmm. So they made some effort to tell her. <laughs> I think she's got to get over it. Am I missing something? I mean, some random person that she didn't know sent her email saying, I'm coming because I'm running from the police and I'm going to be at your house. <laughs> some guy named Sebastian Bowler. And she, she actually has never heard of this guy, never had his email, any of that stuff. There's no actual connection. Sebastian is not no. her friend that's punking her saying, I'm your friend. I'm coming to your house because the police are after me. That's no, not what it's, it's an unidentified man sending her emails. So let's sue somebody for getting a spam email, basically, is what this was. Yeah. If you That's don't know right. the person, you go, oh, wow, this is weird, spam. This is some totally. kind of ad. Right, but this was specific and threatening. She I would guess, say. I guess, look, she has maybe a case because the emails that were sent to her listed her address. So maybe that would cause emotional distress. I don't know. I feel like that's a bit of a stretch. But I think that she overreacted. These were emails. I would probably automatically assume that it's a prank. Like, why would some random guy, some random 25-year-old Englishman named Sebastian Bowler try to come after me? And why would a Nigerian send you an email trying to get some money out of you? Yeah, seriously. Are you going to shoot, uh, shoot Toyota there? Why is this make... What meeting did someone convince some executive at Toyota that this was going to move the matrix? I don't know. <laughs> this was actually an ad campaign created by... Uh, Satachi? Sachi and Sachi. Sachi and Sachi. Um, and I guess they're, they're good at PR because we're talking about it, but that was a horrible ad campaign because that wouldn't make me want to buy a car. Have you seen the new Toyota car, what they have out now? Uh-uh. There's some new, you guys know what the new Toyota is? It was advertised during football a lot. It's like a car. Is it the, Ving, the Venza? The Venza, nice. Is it the car that accelerates without you pressing the? Totally, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that car? Um, and it's being marketed to uh, as people's first cars, mainly girls. Like you're 24, 25, hey, I'm gonna buy my first car. And the ad campaigns are these people who are like thinking that their parents miss them now that they've moved out of the house and on their own. Oh, I've seen those commercials. Yeah, and they're interspersed with like their parents having like the greatest time of their life. And one of the ads ends, well, one of them ends with a girl saying she signed her parents up for MySpace. She's like, because uh, uh, because older people uh, become sort of social malcontents. That's what she's like. And so I've signed my parents up for, for uh, Facebook. And then at the end, she's looking, She's home, her parents are out having the time of their lives, and she's home looking at Facebook on yeah. Saturday night. And she's like, that's not a, that's not a real puppy. <laughs> that's too little to be real. I, that, that is a good commercial. And then the other one is about her parents are miserable without her because she's moved out, and she's making it in the big time here in California, and she's not doing anything. She's like by herself in her apartment. Her parents are on horseback, and they're having, they're having a great time. And she's like, I mean, what are they going to do without me? I'm an only child, except for my sister. <laughs> they're good. That's... That's a good ad campaign. It is. It is. You're right about that. Yeah. So that's a Toyota car? I don't remember. That's a new Toyota, the Venza. Well, right. I guess they cleaned up their act since the last <laughs> ad campaign, which was a disaster. They did. They didn't, they're not threatening anybody with that ad. They're not sending English drunken soccer fanatics to anybody's house. Those girls are safe. <laughs> last week, we did a story a, about a man in Illinois who found $150,000 in his garden. He was looking for tomatoes. Mm -hmm. uh, he wanted to make a nice salad. And he, he, he found that sack of money, and he decided, okay, two, instead of... Two duffel bags. Two duffel bags full of cash. Instead of keeping that money, he decided to call authorities, and then authorities took the money, right? And 
they claim that they're going to try to figure out who it belongs to. Well, now Wayne Sabage, the guy who found the money, is saying that he is uh, fighting with an attorney to get the money back. Okay. Don't, why'd you give the money back to the cops? Would you, if you found $150,000 in cash in your backyard? I was undecided when we originally did this story, but now I am 100% certain that I would have just kept the money. Do we do a what would Jesus do on it? I think we did, yeah, we did. What would he do? That's a stupid question. Yeah, a sorry, question. I'm sorry, I'm sorry ben, I asked. Ben, I know you're not here every day, but come on. No, I'm sorry I asked. It was, insult it was insulting yeah. to ask. Right, Con congratulations on your $150,000 windfall. <laughs> I'd go buy a Benza, you know that? <laughs> I don't know how long you would make that decision. His wife would be like, this is $150,000. It's two different sacks. She'd be, she's going to the house. He'd be like, where are you going? She's like, I'm calling the police. Like, what are you? You're doing what? It's $150,000. Get back here, woman. All of a sudden, you get all, you get all macho. There are uh, risks with taking that money, though, because you don't know where the money came from. I'd call the cops. You would call the cops. Unclear. Yeah. yeah. I would be, I would keep the money, but I would be scared for about a couple months because you, you don't know. Maybe that person who left the money there will come back. I'm not sure that I would keep the money because I, 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 I believe it's the right thing to do. I'm not sure ethics would cause me to keep it. It would be that. It mm -hmm. would be like, this is, uh, this is too messed up. Right. And I would hope that there was some process where if it weren't claimed, I would get the money back. You'd probably do that half-assed conversation first where mm -hmm. you call the cops, you're like, what if a person found 150, and then like, what happens if nobody claims it? When, when might that person get that money back? I, it hasn't happened to me, I'm just having a conversation with a friend. They can get that money back, and they have to fight with a lawyer to get it back, by the way, after a year. If no one claims that money, then they can come back and say, look, no one's claimed the money, time to, you know, so, pay uh, it. So wh who, 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 what lawyer is keeping it? Um, a lawyer isn't keeping it, the police department is keeping oh, it. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, you know why? Because they need the cash. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, totally. Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious to see what would happen if no one claimed it at all. Like, would the, the police department just use it? Yeah. Um, he needs, Buy some weed, some yeah, endo. Give him the money back. I don't, I don't want the cops to have it. I don't mean the police department to have it. They're not, yeah. not going to do any good with it. Give the guy. He's, uh, he's unemployed. He's been out of work for three years. He lives with his 78-year-old father. By the way, this part kind of broke my heart. He's an unemployed man, as you mentioned. And when we originally did this story, we oh, showed man. a video of him and his teeth. He has almost no teeth. And he says, if I get that money back, the first thing I'm going to do is go to the dentist and fix my teeth. And I was just like, oh, I really hope he gets that money back. Wasteful. Well, like see, now it sucks. The fear that um, you guys would have of whoever, whatever this person is that lost it, whatever shady individual this was. Mm -hmm. Now, it's stories everywhere. He's like, oh, yeah. And then there's a big story. Oh, please give this guy his $150,000 back. He's like, I will be back. <laughs> right, totally. Right now, he's going to, like, now they're like, that's where it is. This guy's house. That's right. <laughs> it's like the, oh, that's a good point. Yeah. It's like making, it's publicity. But there's a number, and I don't want to keep dwelling on it, but like, okay, $150,000. I would return it. Mm -hmm. $350,000. Because the fear increases, but so does the life changing nature of it. Right. $3 million. Oh, I would freaking keep it and I'd leave the country. You would? You'd just I'd go to Canada in a heartbeat. Canada, because then you're safe in Canada. Canada's <laughs> awesome. So, and Canada's better than the U.S. No one can find you in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Mobsters get to the Canadian border and they're like, she's gone. See? $3 million, the girl's gone. I, what do we do? How do we get in? No, but what are they, how are they going to find you? I don't know. Why do you have to go to Canada, though? Why don't you just go to... Ohio. <laughs> Eventually, I want to live in Canada anyway, so I would just kill two birds with one stone. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> anyway, I was going to say something else, but I forgot. Oh, I was going to say what uh, Jenks' decision would be. He said that he would, like, steal a couple thousand. Totally. That's, by the way, this is what I was doing. So I was like, no, it was, it was 144,000. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what he said he would do, which is hilarious. Yeah, it's such a halfway nonsense argument. I don't believe that Jenks would return the money. Creature uh, was not a box office hit. It turns out that the film opened in 1,500 theaters. However, it only made $331,000 thus far. On the first opening night, uh, the film only sold six tickets. That can't be right. Is that, that is right, right yes. Um, it actually broke box office records. Really? Yeah. It but, opened it. It opened at that many theaters. Yeah, it had. It was a wide release, which is amazing to me, and it had absolutely no marketing. So of course it's not going to succeed. Why would you think it would succeed? Worst opening in box office history for a film that opened at more than fifteen hundred theaters. That's amazing. Yeah. Why did it get in fifteen hundred theaters if it had no marketing budget 
and no stars. It was end independently financed. Uh, I got it. I got it. So mm -hmm. open in a couple hundred theaters and places and try and do a little stealth campaign. It's embarrassing, man. It's, to it's totally embarrassing. Why would you set yourself up for that kind of failure? Yeah. I, feel I feel bad. I don't, I don't know. I would feel really horrible about it. But at the same time, you have to consider, if there's no marketing, people don't know about it, why would they go see the film? Turns out that the filmmaker said that the website for the film got millions of hits leading up to the opening day. So they thought it would be fine. Right. They were, doing, they were being stealthy. 11% yeah. rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Disaster. Disaster. Yeah. It's a stunning. That's so bad. I feel terrible. It made only slightly more money than that guy found. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last story for you guys. Uh, Khalees was called a slave at a UK airport. It turns out that she was traveling and a man approached her. And you, know what, you know what my problem already is with this hmm. story. What? Predict it. Come on. Predicting? Yeah, predict what my problem with this story is. Um, that you don't care. <laughs> well, that's true on every story. Uh -huh. <laughs> Either, no, no, I don't know who Kelly is. Oh, oh, <laughs> she's the one with the milkshake that brings the boys to the yard. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, well, she's very good. Good for her. <laughs> I love a milkshake. She, um, she was, I think she still sings. I don't know. I haven't heard any music released from her in a while. But uh, there's Kelly. She was uh, married to Nas for a while. They divorced. They had a very messy, sticky divorce. Mm. Um, but there she is, posing with Nas. Uh, I'm not 100 percent sure who Nas is. Nas is uh, a rapper. <laughs> um, do you think he picked that chain out, like aggressively, or do you think it was a gift? Like, I, I think he. I don't think anyone would buy him that as a gift. He probably purchased it himself. So, you, or you don't think he has a buy? Like he goes and he's like he tries it on and he looks at it in the mirror and he's like, yes. I do think he does that. Yeah. Ridiculous. It's it's you know it's cool in that. No, it's not. It's ridiculous. But a lot of rappers wear chains that are, you know. Anyone wearing that chain is a douchebag. <laughs> That's all there is to it. I Does Kanye West still wear his uh, Jesus chain? Does anyone know? No? Does anyone think that that looks good? Really? I, I don't care. But, I mean, it's no, style. I don't care. I just mean at some point you look at Ben Nelson's hair and you know he's a douchebag. You know, yeah. the, the, <laughs> you look at that guy's chain and you're like, no, come on, dude. No. I, I, I think it ties the outfit together, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> He's bringing back the DMC look. The run DMC look. That That's was like a, that was a little, but no. The old school. All right, you guys are afraid that people are going to call you racist. I'm I'm <laughs> uh, I can speak my mind. It's a moronic look, okay? It's uh -huh. a giant chain. It looks like you got it out of an alley. Put it back. Wear something else. But isn't that look? Th the whole whole point of that is to show that you have money and you're a successful rapper. It's like, look at my chains, I have gold teeth, that, that whole thing. It's almost like a given. That's why when I saw that picture. So why stop anywhere? Why not wear a gold suit? I mean, is there anything that's- I'm sure if they could, they would. I mean, what, what would stop them? Oh, they could. No, that's what they would do. I see. <laughs> Great, that's what. Um, what's that commercial, the Cadillac commercial now, where some clear uh, rap mogul, I'm guessing, or hip hop mogul gets out of the car and he's like, Cadillac, it's Los, Los Angeles, and he's like, that's what we do. And it's just him driving up to a club. Have you seen this ad? It's Dr. Dre driving the, it the is, Chrysler 300. It's the, it's the Chrysler 300, which looks like a lovely car. I don't understand the ad, because he drives up, it's a club, and it's like that back alley of a club. It's like the secret back door of a club. That's what I said. And he's like, this is Los Angeles. It's what we do. C can we find that ad? Is it possible? I really want to see that. I but, haven't seen that ad. But what do they do? What is it that we do? We I drive nice cars. We're flossing. <laughs> We're flossing. That's <laughs> <laughs> what we do. Yeah, I don't know what it is. The car looks really nice, but I, I don't. I don't know. It's all. Everything's. Everything now is style over substance. <laughs> Grandpa Ben. Totally. I. I I get uh, I get a little outraged. Do you know the ad? Have you seen it? You JR is obviously seen it. I love how we started this story. JR, with... JR knows the ads because JR and I watch like 37 hours of football, which is clearly when these ads are running. Because why else would you see a commercial? <laughs> That's why I haven't seen it. Right. You're totally right. And everything else is on TiVo. I go through it. I watch it on the computer. I got nothing. But if it's a live game, I gotta watch the commercial. By the way, I love how we started this story with Khalees was called a slave at a UK airport, and all of a sudden we're talking like it totally devolved into. Uh, why was she, why was she called a, a slave? Okay. Who cares about that? Let's watch the commercial. Oh, yeah. Some people say good things come to those who wait. Truth is, 
good things come to those who work. Who work later. And work harder. They're willing to go farther than anyone else to get them. If you're waiting for good things to come to you, <laughs> you'll be waiting for a pretty long time. This is L.A. This is what we do. <laughs> that is what we do. I like the slogan, though, I must say. I was going to make fun of the slogan when I first saw it, but the imported from Detroit. Mm -hmm. It's a little badass. Um, I don't know who's the narrator. It's not Dr. Dre. The narrator's not. It sounds, it's painful. I don't think it's painful. It was a little too long, but I thought it was a pretty cool ad. I love ads like that that make you feel, I don't know, sexy. That ad made me feel sexy for some reason. <laughs> well, A, you are sexy, so you should have already felt that way. I don't understand. I get it. I Look, I'm wrong. It's, I, and I remembered it. I guess it worked. Mm -hmm. I remembered it. I just didn't know it was Dr. Dre because I'm a child. Um, and I like Dr. Dre. It's because uh, you're old. You're, you're not a child. No, I meant like a child emotionally. Yeah. Oh. But well, yes. obviously, well, the other thing, they were advertising the sound system in those new 300s. It's oh. Dre's Beats sound system. He makes headphones, all that stuff. It's a whole line of, of sound system right. stuff. Right. So, I, I did get that yeah, the first yeah. time because it was really loud in my house, which I didn't. But still, it's super long. And... Uh, and I don't get, I, like, I hate when people just say stuff. I hate it. I hate it. But I hate it. I hate it. I don't think he just said that, though. Like, as a, as a Los Angeles native, when he said that, I was like... No, but it's not a thing. It's what we do. It's, it's, it's what, what we, we do. do. What? <laughs> we drive nice cars. We work hard. Yeah. We make our money. Good things don't come to those who wait. That's they right. come to those who work hard. This is what we do. Yeah, I love it. That's a great app. Racists. <laughs> yeah, no one doesn't wait in a line, fool. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. You win. I'm wrong. That was our show for you guys. We'll see you guys tomorrow. <laughs>